Can you please take your seats? Can you please take your seats? Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, sorry for starting a little bit late, um, but people are still arriving. Let's take your seats. Um, it's an honor for me to uh, moderate this uh, panel, coming together or moving apart the future of multilateralism. And of course, we all understand that we had a, after the Second World War, we had like, you know, uh, very strong uh, multilateral institutions that have been built and that have been uh, eroded by civil uh, events, the Korea War, uh, the, um, the end of the uh, uh, Bretton Woods uh, Agreement, like uh, on the 15th of August, 71, like it was, you know, uh, done at the time. Uh, we had, uh, but we had a very important um, renaissance of UN in 91. Uh, you remember the um, UN operation of liberation of Kuwait. Uh, and then we have, again, uh, multilateralism has been uh, attacked uh, by um, initiatives um, from America invading um, uh, Iraq in 2003 without any mandate from UN. And recently, of course, uh, the attack of Russia against Ukraine in 2022 so, of course, multilateralism is not in the best shape, and we will uh, try to understand why and uh, why and how we can um, uh, build a better future for multilateralism, which we hope will uh, prevent a uh, third, a third um, uh, world war. Uh, to uh, try to understand, we have here, uh, Grégory uh, Lecomte is uh, French, is head of Central Asia um, at, um, uh, sp responsible of Eurasia and, um, and global relations in um, OSC. OCD, okay, 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 okay. Uh, in, uh, so OECD, Organization of Economic and uh, uh, Corporation and Development, an organization that has been founded by 20 countries in the 60s and now uh, have how many countries now? 38. 38, so it's a progress. And, and, and it is in, in, in Paris. But we have it's why I have uh, this confusion. We have all, um, we have also Margareta. Can you, can you stand, Margareta, so everybody can see you? Yes, so Margareta Sederfeld, she's Swedish, she's an MP in Sweden. And she's the president of the OSCE Parliament Assembly. So uh, the OSCE, Correct me if I'm wrong, comes from the Helsinki Conference of 1975 uh, on uh, regional cooperation um, and has been very active, for instance, during the, the, um, the 2014 and 15 events between Ukraine and, and Russia. We remember uh, OSC uh, controlling uh, the, 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 the ceasefire. Um, 
and um, this organization uh, have, have got like 57 countries and as you told me it goes from Brest, Brest in France not in uh, Belarusia, to it goes to Brest to, to, to Vladivostok, no? Could you, could you please use the, the microphone? Okay, so, uh, so a huge organization, so thank you uh, for coming uh, to uh, talk to us. And I have also um, Ambassador Omuraliev, who is um, the Secretary General of the Organization of Turkic States. Thank you, Ambassador, for coming. Uh, he's from Kyrgyzstan, but the organization uh, sits in, in Turkey and um, have like various um, countries close to the Turkish culture, including, if I am not wrong, including Hungary. Is it true or not? Okay. Uh, so uh, then we have uh, Judge Mohammed Abdel Salam is um, Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Elders. He comes from the Emirates. Can you stand, Mohammed, please, so that we can. Okay. Um, and we have also Amil Sokla. Uh, Amil, can you can you stand, please? He's from South Africa and is the Sherpa for the BRICS organization. And you all, we all remember that there was uh, very recently, I think uh, three or four days ago, five days ago maybe, um, a meeting, a ministerial meeting of the BRICS um, uh, in South Africa. BRICS meaning, of course, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, um, uh, China uh, and South Africa. And Sergei Lavrov attended this uh, BRICS uh, ministerial uh, meeting that was in Cape Town, if I am not wrong. Okay. So, uh, great. So, thank you uh, very much. And um, coming together of moving apart. So, um, how do you see uh, Gregory, how do you see uh, the future? of uh, multilateralism. Just give us a short assessment. There will be no speech today. It's only question answers. It will be a dialogue. Thank you, Renaud. There will be no speech, but still thank you to Kazakhstan for hosting us. Yeah. Now, <laughs> answering your question. Uh, I will start oh, with... First, first I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot something, and I will be castigated. I forgot something that before you speak, there is a person quite uh, important and working quite a lot for multilateralism is Ban Ki-moon, who addressed a message. Is it true? Okay, we have a message first to hear from Ban Ki-moon. Your Excellency Kasim Jomart Tokayev, President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, distinguished leaders, experts, and participants, ladies and gentlemen, Hello, Salametve. It is my great pleasure to convey my warm congratulations to President Tokayev and the Republic of Kazakhstan for successfully organizing the Astana International Forum 2023, a forum to engage in dialogue and seek solutions to global problems such as climate change, food shortages, and energy security. As the President of the Assembly and Chair of the Council of the Global Green Growth Institute, I am appreciative of Kazakhstan, of member states of GGGI, for the efforts to bring global leaders together and to respond to these, these global challenges together. Although I am unable to join you in Astana, I am pleased to lend my support to the forum and to express my commitment that GGGI 
will continue to help its member states to adapt to climate change and transition to green growth, an environmentally sustainable and socially inclusive model of development, from green assessment and policy development to climate finance mobilization and project implementation. As you may know, the Paris Climate Change Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development are often mentioned as a two of my most important legacies of my time as the Secretary General of the United Nations. These global issues are starting now at the Astana International Forum so that history will reflect the global community made major strides in the year 2023 to leave a better world for future generations. I wish all of you very green, productive, and successful events. Thank you very much. Kobrak miet. So, uh, Gregory, tell us, how can we, after the failure of um, the Normandy format on Ukraine and after other failures, uh, how can we bring, according to you, a more constructive diplomacy? Thank you, Renaud. So I was saying thanks to Kazakhstan and thanks to you for, for coming. Uh, I'm not sure I have the ambition to solve the global problem such as uh, what's happened after the normal format. However, I can talk a bit about what we do at the OECD, it's uh, economic diplomacy and economic multilateralism. I'll start with uh, a contradiction. On the one hand, uh, we have never uh, been in such a situation like today when we need multilateralism. You have what? Pandemic, global challenge, climate change, Again, it's global. Three is probably tomorrow how to manage the risk of artificial intelligence, another global challenge. So one country alone cannot solve this, which means that we do need multilateralism. However, this, this mere concept and rules are being questioned uh, by many, it could be by citizens, via populist movements, or even by governments when they withdraw from uh, ongoing treaties, for instance. And the mere fact that we are having this session today is an indication that multilateralism is being questioned. So how to explain this, uh, this contradiction? I will just uh, formulate an hypothesis that probably that economically, slower growth, uh, rising economic inequalities make uh, people frustration increasing, which uh, then uh, turn into frustration against uh, the current uh, system. In emerging dynamic economies, uh, countries, there's this feeling that uh, the current system is not reflecting uh, the new balance of power. And in advanced economies, such as OECD countries, sometimes there's this feeling that at, at the end of the 20th century, the world, uh, the share of OECD countries in the GDP, world GDP, was of 60% in purchase per parity. Today it's 45 and tomorrow, in the next five years, will be even less, around uh, 43, according to recent uh, forecasts. It means that there is a shift toward east and south, and this has somehow to be reflected in the, in the rules and institutions that shape multilateralism uh, today. It's not a bad news that there is this shift, I want to say. It has uh, created a lot of wealth for uh, developed economies. It's, it has lifted out of poverty a lot of uh, pe people from uh, more, less advanced uh, countries. So this polycentrism is a, is a given and we have to, to deal with that. It puts pressure on the, ongoing, on the current uh, system. So what is the way forward? So to answer your, your question, how do we, what could we recommend at the OECD? We love making recommendations. What could we suggest to, to move this uh, forward? So these tectonic, tectonic shifts uh, will continue. As I said, it will, it will, uh, it's a, it will, there will be a rebalance of, uh, of, of, of power between the different countries in, in, in the world. So we probably have to adapt uh, the international institutions, and I will give an example of uh, OECD. So we, our ambition is uh, not to be universal. We don't want everyone as a member, 
but we still want to be global, meaning that to engage with countries that are not members. And the mere fact that we uh, come to Central Asia often is an indication of this willingness to engage more with countries that are not necessarily members. So engaging more is one. Two, we must be more pragmatic, and uh, I wouldn't say that like-mindedness is uh, necessary. As we don't need to agree on everything. However, we need to define properly the problem we want to solve all together, and for this we need to be pragmatic. So climate change is something we can all agree on, for instance, so let, let's agree on and solve it to, together. So let's define concrete issues with uh, concrete outcomes to be achieved. This is two. And three, there is probably an effort in terms of communication towards citizens, so they should understand better the benefits of uh, multilateralism, uh, also governments, per perhaps. I will give an example from OECD again. We worked on, uh, we have the OECD Convention on uh, Anti-Bribery. This has helped uh, many countries that joined this uh, convention to fight uh, corruption in their respective uh, jurisdiction. This is one. So helping uh, fight uh, financial crime, this is one. Another recent example is tax evasion. We have this project on, sorry for interpretation, base erosion and profit shifting. More than 100 countries have joined, and this allows uh, jurisdictions that joined to, to, to basically strengthen the tax base and uh, fight uh, properly against uh, tax evasion. These are two examples. I could give the last one that is very recent and has become a key initiative is uh, inclusive framework on carbon mitigation approach, basically uh, joining forces to understand how to better mitigate the effects of uh, carbon on, 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 on the climate change and how to, how to decarbonize economies as well. So this will be all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Gregory. Uh, we all know that the OCD Convention for on, on, on Bribery has been very efficient, adopted throughout Europe, and changed the way uh, big corporations are doing uh, business now throughout uh, the world. So uh, it's obviously a very um, a great success of um, OECD. Um, uh, now I would like to go to you, Margareta, um, and uh, we remember that uh, your organization, OSC, was very important uh, in, not, not, uh, for instance, in the Caucasus Mountain. You had, uh, you know, uh, uh, to keep the peace in the 2000s. Um, um, it was a very, I guess it's still a very important mission of OSC. Um, of course, uh, now um, uh, your people uh, are not, have left. They were between separating Russians and Ukrainians. I understand that they have left uh, the terrain uh, because of the war. But how do you see um, the uh, future of your organization and what can be done according to you to improve uh, efficiency and to, to improve actually uh, the fact that the, 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 the nations go back to uh, multilateralism and go back to the, I would say, the, the hopes of uh, 1945 when the uh, United Nations was created. Thank you very much for this important question. When there is a war going on, like now, I believe it's very common that all countries look up after its own security. What can be done to secure our people? But I believe also that there is an important ground for multilateralism to find ways forward. And if we are talking about a situation when it's war, I, I believe just as former Secretary General said, let's work together. That's what's about. And if we should talk about finance, uh, if we should talk about economy, that's a very important issue. I know that if there should be an economic growth, there need to be stability, there need to be peace. 
This is very important. But let me also tell you that OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, it's not Europe, it's 57 countries, as I mentioned, from Vladivostok to Vancouver, and it's three pillars in the broad security perspective. The first one is political, political and security pillar. The second one is uh, environment and finance. Uh, and the third one is human rights and democracy. And this is because all these three pillars are very important. But I do also believe that if there should be a way forward, there is a need for cooperation. And there is also a need for the parliamentarian. If it should be democracy, there need to be parliaments elected by the people. And that's we in the parliamentarian assembly. And we are the best parliamentarians, lawmakers. We are the ones who scrutinize the government. We are the ones who adapt the budget. Of course, we should also cooperate. That's the only way forward. And let me mention, on the sides of the war in Ukraine, there is a lack of food, there is a, a lack of energy, there is the inflation, uh, the climate is affected. All these issues need to be handled by cooperation, by multilateralism. First of all, the peace. There is not peace yet. Ukraine haven't got its right to its territory. But for me and for the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, because we have a decision on it, is to support Ukraine. But I must underline the importance, as I said uh, first, of uh, stability and peace for economic growth. It's also about, if we should have a better climate, implementation of the SDGs, we need international cooperation. We need international cooperation between the lawmakers. We need also, of course, for, for the energy, for the issue that's so important, I think, not only here in Kazakhstan, but for the whole area from Vladivostok to the end of Europe, and by this also for the transatlantic side. It's the mid-corridor. How to build a mid-corridor if there is not multilateralism? I don't see any other way forward. That's just what I would like to say. We need cooperation. We need it during the Cold War when OSCE was founded. And we need it today when there is an, other, when there is an open war. I think with mediation, there can be an end of the war and a more transparent and fruitful way forward for the multilateralism and for economic growth, for democracy, and also for a better world. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Margareta. <clears throat> Anil, uh, you are the Sherpa of the BRICS. Um, of course, the BRICS have got um, on um, the war between Russia and Ukraine, another uh, assessment than uh, the West. The West uh, uh, was uh, the West. What is the West? The West uh, was a meeting in uh, Hiroshima in Japan. This is the West, the global West, if you like, uh, led by America. Uh, and um, um, the BRICS um, doesn't seem to be led by any country. Um, can you tell us what kind of uh, help uh, they can bring to uh, stop this war uh, and also uh, to stop the shift that we are tending uh, more and more bitter between not only the West and Russia, but also the West and China. How uh, you can, we can stop it and how you can revive uh, multilateralism which have been violated not only by Russia, because you have to remember that uh, Western powers, I belong to a Western power, have violated um, the, uh, also the multilateralism uh, several uh, times, for instance, in Iraq or in Libya. So can you, can you tell us how do you see that? 
Thank you, Chair, firstly, for having me on this panel and including BRICS as part of the discussion. Since you mentioned Hiroshima and the recent G7 summit and we are talking of multilateralism, let me refer to what United Nations Secretary General said on the margins of that meeting in an interview, which has been widely reported in the global press, specifically referring to the UNSC and the Bretton Woods Institution. He stated that these organizations are in serious need of reform. He used three phrases to describe them. He said they are outdated, dysfunctional, and unfair. Now, I think he was being very diplomatic in choosing those words. But I think it's very apt that the head of the United Nations system is referring to these organizations. And I don't think he was limiting himself just to the UNSC and the Bretton Woods Institution. I think he was speaking of his frustration of the entire multilateral architecture. He further stated at Hiroshima that the global north must do more to address the frustrations of the global south. And I hope we all listen carefully to what the head of the UN body is saying. Now, let me come specifically to BRICS. Now, reform of the multilateral system has been a standing agenda item from the formation of BRICS. And that's why this year under South Africa's presidency, you will see that the theme we chose was BRICS and Africa, partnership for mutually accelerated growth, sustainable development, and inclusive multilateralism. We deliberately chose the word inclusive multilateralism because that's part of the problem we have today. If you go back to the lofty principles of the UN Charter, go back to the preamble. The preamble states very clearly that we must practice tolerance and live in harmony with each other. Today, there's no tolerance, there's intolerance. There is no harmony amongst nations and people, there's disharmony. And when we speak of reform of the multilateral system, both the political, the economic, and the financial architecture, we want to see a strong UN. And when we speak of the United Nations, let us not forget, that's our body. We created it for ourselves to serve us. It's not some abstract body that we are talking about. And I think you spoke about the value that multilateralism still has. Recently, the High Seas Treaty was negotiated after 20 years, which is to the benefit of all of humanity. So multilateralism has a role to play. But the 51 founding members of 1945, there were only four African countries there. Today, we are 193 members. Obviously, we need not only a reform, but a transform multilateral system. And this is what BRICS is saying. Let us collectively, the global North and South, as we loosely speak to the North, of the North and South, as a collective, let us reform this organization to reflect the realities of 2023. 1945 is far behind us. The major part of Africa was still under colonial rule. The major part of the world was still under colonial rule when these rules and regulations were written. So we are saying that BRICS is there to work in conjunction with everyone, not just the global south. We do so as individuals. The G20 is a bridge that brings together all BRICS countries are there, the G7 is there, all of the leading economies of the world are there. We do cooperate. But I think there's a danger of us paralyzing, like we did the multilateral architecture, of even paralyzing the G20. We are seeing the difficulties to get outcome documents from ministerials. We're not sure if we will get an outcome document at the G20 summit in, in India in September this year. We should not politicize these bodies. These bodies are there to serve the people, and we forget why we created these bodies. So we want to see a strong, reformed multilateral system that is inclusive, that is equitable, that is fair, and that is just. And that can only happen if there's a political will amongst all of us. And I think the theme chosen by the Astana International Forum is very apt. It speaks of cooperation. It speaks of prosperity. We want common prosperity for all. When we adopted the SDGs at the 70th anniversary of the UN, we said, leave no one behind. But that's a catchphrase. COVID saw us leaving the majority of the world behind because we end, ended up 
in vaccine hoarding, vaccine nationalism, vaccine apartheid. You only took care of each other, and yet it was a common enemy and an opportunity for us to work together to defeat this common enemy. But what we saw? Greater polarization. And now major conflict and contestation is the norm of the day. We need cooperation, we need dialogue, as the forum sa said. South Africa, we got democracy through dialogue, through peaceful means. And we need the North and the South to work in tandem with each other, reform the multilateral system to be inclusive and fair and serve the global community as a whole. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. You have uh, given us a very important message, Anil, which is do not politicize economic cooperation forums because anyway we need it. Um, so um, in my youth, in my youth, there was only one region where you could find wars. It was the Middle East. You had the uh, Israeli-Arab wars, then you had, of course, um, the civil war in Lebanon, you had the war uh, between Iraq and, um, and Iran in the 80s, and then you had the, fir the, the, the uh, Kuwait war of uh, 91, and then another war in uh, 2003, and then um, in another, another uh, the war in Syria, and then the war in Libya, and so on. Uh, but now in the Gulf, Mohammed, we have a better situation. Uh, when you open CNN and uh, you want to, uh, to see what are the news, it doesn't start with a war in the Middle East. It's finished. We had great progresses. We saw Abraham Accord, uh, Israel and, the, um, and all these countries of the, um, of the uh, Persian Gulf. You had uh, very recently China uh, making a deal between Iran, the two sides of the Gulf, Iran and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. Um, you had recently, um, and I remember that you were the first Arab country to, or one of the first Arab country to reopen an embassy in uh, Damascus, uh, if I am not mistaken. Uh, Syria came back to the Arab League. So um, we can say that now um, your region is some kind uh, in a progress. It's a new hub. Uh, it seems that it's kind of a new hub of multilateralism. So how, how do you think multilateralism helped you and how it will help you again in the future. How do you see that, uh, Mohamed, in your region? Thank you, Gerard. I will speak in Arabic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gerard. I would like to congratulate for your smart moderation of the session. You have transformed it from the planned speeches into a serious dialogue and very constructive dialogue. And I'd like to thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, in fact, you started your uh, question with something very important about the future of diversity in international uh, relations. We have two uh, clear options. Either we uh, come together or uh, fall apart or disagree. We don't have a third option in the front of us as we uh, encounter these uh, catastrophic uh, challenges which are multilateral, like the climate change, like uh, conflicts and wars and the risks of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and the uh, challenges of uh, food and water shortages. You, you've asked me about how the multi uh, uh, lateralism has uh, helped the Middle East region to have a better situation and a better future. 
you are right. I'm not uh, as old as you. And uh, uh, although you are still young in your spirit, your thinking, and your smartness, uh, I'm, I, I was uh, born in the early 80s, and I was born to hear about the um, the news uh, of wars coming from war into another and from conflict into another and these wars generate frustration among the young people and the successive generations but we what we are seeing now in the middle east we are seeing uh, a cultural and intellectual growth accompanied by uh, growing political wisdom let me uh, set the link between this uh, multilateralism and the religious perspectives that have uh, contributed to the improvement of relations. Perhaps all of you heard about the first historic joint uh, visit of the most important uh, Muslim uh, figure, along with His Holiness Pope Francis, uh, to the United Arab Emirates, and they have signed together the first of its kind document on human relations, These, this document of human fraternity in which the two leaders, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar and Pope Francis, addressed all believers and non-believers, uh, stressing the importance of multilateralism without uh, focusing or limiting or favoring um, Christianity or Islam or any other religion, but talking about the importance of collective action against the global challenges. It also highlight you have also uh, highlighted the Abraham Accords and uh, the uh, the the what we can call the melting of the old issues and problems between Iran and the other countries and the between the uh, Syria and other countries and also the return of Syria to the Arab League. This proves the importance of multilateralism. But I would like to say that multilateralism is uh, a, a, an established pillar of the policies and the vision of the uh, Arab world and the Middle East. Uh, we haven't generated these wars. These wars and conflicts were imposed on us, and they have uh, troubled successive generations in our region. And uh, these uh, wars were uh, planned from outside the region and were exported to us. But uh, multilateralism at the regional level and at the global level is very important, and, they, and it has helped us. And we need to invest in this multilateralism, and we would like also to export this uh, culture of multilateralism and multilateral collaboration to other countries. We have uh, a, a kind of harmony and close collaboration between uh, many countries, between United Arab Emirates and the other countries in the region, including the Arab uh, Republic of Egypt. And we have also uh, uh, developed paradigms for collaboration in a legal framework. And as uh, Secretary General, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, said that he supports these uh, all efforts of uh, uh, multilateralism, I also announce my support for the uh, a new approach. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, um, and it's true that um, even me, who comes from the West, we have to 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 say and to acknowledge that probably we didn't respect multilateralism enough. And history shows us that. Um, uh, history shows us that um, number one, um, the um, invasion of Iraq without authorization of United Nations, uh, so with uh, being scornful or despising multilateralism, created a huge mess the, that is not yet settled. That is not yet yes. settled. Yes. And um, and we, the French, we were the leader of um, an operation in Libya in 2011 when there was on the Libyan uh, ground some kind of multilateral uh, operation by uh, the uh, Organization of African Unity. 
and we were quick to act. We create a huge chaos, but not only a chaos in Libya, a chaos in the whole region by not respecting multilateralism. The region is called Sahel. And then we tried by a second war to repair uh, uh, what has been done uh, in the first war, and we did not manage. And the mess is still there. So uh, yes, multilateralism is uh, very important. And I hope that in the future, um, our Western nations will, um, will uh, respect it. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, it applies also to, uh, this is obvious, uh, to um, uh, Russia uh, that did not ask the UN to solve its uh, problems with Ukraine, but preferred to attack it. So um, I would like uh, uh, Ambassador Muralyev, you are from a region, the uh, organization of Turkic states, that I would be in, it is not as bad as Eastern Europe, where we have a total failure. Um, it is not as good um, as uh, uh, the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, where you know, peace is growing day by day. It's in the middle. Um, um, can, you, uh, can you tell us um, what kind of um, ambition have your organization, organization of Turkic states and how it can improve uh, peace in the region. And of course, uh, we uh, all think of uh, a war that is happening uh, from time to time uh, between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, first of all, let me also to express my appreciation to the government of uh, Kazakhstan for inviting uh, me uh, to the Astana International Forum. And I would like to welcome all of participants is here in the capital of Brazil, Kazakhstan. Is, uh, just to, in, to start in our panel, you Ask me and, uh, how many countries is member states. Member state is five countries, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkey, and the Uzbekistan. But you mentioned Hungary is observer states. So as Turkmenistan too. Uh, this is first of all, but uh, uh, our uh, population is, our uh, member state is 173 the more than 173 million uh, people and total area uh, is, uh, is 4,823 square kilometers and the GDP is total is our organization is 1.4 trillion US dollars but trade turnover between our countries is 42.5 billion dollars. Uh, for your direct question, is, but uh, a small remark regarding our organization. It was created 2009, but our uh, Brazil countries, Brazil nation have 100,000 years history, but only is after collapse Soviet Union, after uh, end of uh, Cold War, uh, Cold, uh, is starting is our leaders together, from 1992 is finally is 2009 in Nakhchivan in in Azerbaijan it was created our organization first is founder uh, countries is four but Uzbekistan is joined later it four years ago just for uh, about our organization and for just your attention chairman um, uh, the multilateralism, uh, it is uh, core, 
represent the power of unity. It is uh, embodiment of cooperation, collaboration, and the shared responsibility among nations. In an area marked by intercontinence and the independence, no single nation can single-handedly tackle the complex challenges that uh, transcend borders. It is through collective action and the joint efforts uh, we can work a path towards a more prosperous and a secure future. The organization of Turkic states comprising Turkic nations, recognizing the significance of multilateralism in advancing our common objectives. Together, uh, we have embraced the principle of dialogue, mutual respect, and the solidarity to foster deeper regional integration and the cooperation. By working hand in hand, we have realized the potential for enhanced trade, cultural exchange, and the sustainable development within our member states. But, however, we as discuss the future of multilateralism, we must acknowledge the evolving dynamics that surround us. Global uncertainties, rising geopolitical tension, and the emergence of protectional tendencies have challenged by very funding of military, multilateral cooperation. Uh, the burst of Russian-Ukraine war displayed an earthquake effect for the geopolitical and the geoeconomic equation in Eurasia, resulting in dramatic shift in global affairs. On one hand, this picture reminded us the shortcoming in today's multilateralism that should be more representative and uh, inclusive. Oh, on the other hand, it dramatically showed that universal principle, such as respect to sovereign equality, territorial integrity, and the inviolability of internationally recognizing borders could be still challenged even today. But in the region, you do, you do not have... But in our uh, region no. is... Uh, between in our, uh, in our region is more than stable. Of course, time to time, we have regional conflict. You mentioned uh, Azerbaijan and the Armenia conflict. Yes, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's during 30, almost 30 years, this conflict is, was continuing. It's finally, is this issue done, and the, the all of in who is sitting in the room is in the last news regarding is uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenian negotiation. I hope all will be uh, to, and soon it will be done, and the peace will become in between these two uh, uh, countries. But today's morning session is uh, first is. President Tokayev mentioned middle corridor is also, in, as you know, this is between uh, Caspian, is our three to four member and the observer state is very active. This is Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and the Turkey. But of course, this is before is since, you know, the uh, is. Uh, conflict between Ukraine and the Russia is war. It's traditional it's logistic and transport is already is, how say is close. So nice middle corridor if you before considering us more alternatively, now is becoming reality. So this is uh, to benefit to everyone, not only to our region and the it is middle corridor connecting will be east in the west, same time, and you know, just to uh, in north and south too. So, is this corridor is another one is uh, 
to Azerbaijan and Armenia is uh, Zangizar corridor is more to be benefit bring to Armenia. So I hope it will be to pay attention to all leaders and the, also hope to soon it will be get this solution is done. Thank you very much, Ambassador. An important message, the corridor between the west and the east and even also the north and the south, um, uh, of course, helping the future of multilateralism. Uh, Grégory, I would like to come back to you to ask you, uh, you, you are from the uh, Organization of uh, Economic uh, Cooperation. Can you give us a concrete example? Because, we, of course, we have to improve, to go back to a good situation of multilateralism, step by step. What would be the first concrete step, it can be climate change, whatever, that you would propose us to start to try to, to heal this uh, multilateralism that is in a very bad shape for the time being? Well, as I said, I would start to be as concrete as possible. If we don't, if assuming we, it's all countries of the world trying to sit around the same table, we may not share the same opinion on everything, but perhaps we can agree on concrete objective to be achieved together. So I would call it a more bottom-up approach. Let's agree on something we want to solve all together. And this is what the OECD aims at doing on a specifically identified uh, problem, such as climate change, tax evasion, as I said, uh, uh, and there may be other, other, um, other issues. But I want to comment on what I heard. And in the end, multilateralism is a quite flexible word. It can be sub, uh, regional, it can be worldwide, it can be a, an organization like the OECD, it can be an informal platform like today, perhaps. Um, the agenda can also quite be flexible. It could be just uh, sitting on the same table is already an achievement. I remember 10 years ago, having Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan at the OECD together was already an achievement. So this can be the, uh, very, sitting at the same table could be already an objective, or solving an issue could be the objective, something more ambitious. So, so the ambition is also quite flexible. So my main conclusion from what I hear is that uh, the, this concept is flexible enough uh, so people cannot disagree on the fact that multilateralism is needed. But what we try to do at the OECD is to achieve something via this uh, concept. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I think that you are totally right to say that um, this uh, forum that we are sitting in, of course, participates to... Uh, multilateralism. It will be reported in the press. People talk to each other. Ideas are growing, emerging from these talks. Um, I remember being in a forum called, it was called Club de Monaco, but we were having Israeli delegates. It was like private secret, if you like, but uh, Iranian delegates and uh, Israeli delegates speaking together. Of course, one day, uh, Israel and, uh, and uh, Iran uh, will have to resume diplomatic relations like uh, Iran and America. It's, of course, ridiculous that America and Iran still do not have um, um, diplomatic relations, have to go to Oman to talk to each other. Uh, but thank you, Oman, for organizing this dialogue. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it is, um, we have a very important um, step and, um, and uh, Margareta, I would like to ask you uh, from um, your perspective, um, and especially in the West, what can we do to improve this multi multilateralism uh, and especially uh, because you, of course, you are president of this uh, organization, but you also you come from Sweden, and Sweden in the past has, has been very uh, important in in um, in conferences and in uh, uh, in um, um, in building uh, multilateralism. Um, not speaking about the Peace Nobel Prize and so on. Uh, so tell us, what is, how, do you, how do you see this from your perspective? 
Yes, uh, if I should start to say what's already have been said in some world, but I put it a little bit different, it's about there have always, when it's a crisis, when it's a problem, been an attack on multilateralism. It was during the Second World War, it was also saying that UN didn't prevent the war and didn't manage to stop the Second World War. And now we could see that uh, Russia's attack, aggression against Ukraine, Ukraine, it's also blamed on UN, it's blamed on OSCE, it's blamed on multilateralism to not be able to stop it. But I would turn this another way. The war is actually an attack on multilateralism. And uh, I, I believe strongly that there is a need to cooperate, that there was actually on behalf of OSCE early, before the outbreak of the war, uh, SMM, uh, observation mission in Ukraine. And it was decided inside OSCE on the governmental side. Those who took part in the observation mission, they were from all over around of OSCE countries. It meant that it was person who was sent out from the various countries who worked together to prevent uh, violence and to promote peace and stability. And when it comes to how to continue to work with multilateralism. Let me mention OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. We have in our committee for decision, the standing committee, it's one delegation, head of each country's delegation who have one vote. For me, this shows that there is respect between every countries. It can't be that one country shouldn't have a vote. Every country have a vote, regardless if it's a huge, large country like Russia or US, or if it's San Marino, Liechtenstein, or if it's Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, or Kazakhstan. It's one head of delegation, one vote. And for me, this is respect for every country, regardless of the size or the population. And uh, in a parliamentary assembly, there is, of course, always a suggestion. Every country, every delegate have the possibility to put the suggestion forward. There is a debate, it goes for rules that are equal for everybody. And then there is the decision and the format. I don't see that that's actually should be against multilateralism because it's based on respect, it's based on transparency, it's based on also a system that's uh, predictable. And I say that when it's a crisis, it's very difficult to work together because there is warriors perspective, warriors uh, perception for the future, but if there should be really multilateralism, we need to have respect for each other, both on an individual level, but also on a country level. And I believe also it's important to look forward, to see that there is a day tomorrow, and what can we do? What can we do to have a better better tomorrow. I mentioned an end of the war, but that's not enough. We need also to look further on, to look on all the issues that were mentioned earlier. What can we do? And I say we, because I am a politician, and so are all the others in OSCE, Parliamentary Assembly. If I should speak from a Swedish perspective, I should say that also here, support peace, stability, support economic growth. And that means that all countries should also promote their stability. It can't be, if I speak, go back to an OSCE perspective, 
one country who should be responsible for others. It's always the country who are responsible for their own country and for the development. And I think that's also a ground when we are talking about multilateralism, that nobody should take over any other's country's responsibility. Th Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaita. Um, um, Mohamed, um, about climate change, because your country will host the next COP. Um, it's, I think, COP, what is it, 27 or 8, uh, whatever, um, the next conference of the organizing parties. Um, do you think that multilateralism, like it's, it will be uh, organized um, um, in uh, Abu Dhabi, can really uh, fight um, the um, effect of the climate change on, on the world? Thank you, Gerard. Speaking of the COP28 that will be hosted in the United Arab Emirates towards the end of November and will last for two weeks, I expect that the world will witness a different edition of the COP28. There are preparations going on to activate what we are discussing now. I mean multilateralism to be an evidence and a sign of the activating cooperation between all participants in the COP. For the first time, I give you an example. For the first time, there will be a, 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 an ad hoc pavilion for, uh, for interfaith dialogue and the role of religions and cultures in contributing to alleviating the fallout of the climate change. This will there will also be uh, a, a high level meeting between religious leaders in our world prior to the COP to explore how religious leaders and how religious figures who have, uh, uh, who have a spiritual influence on many communities, how they can contribute to raising awareness of the climate change. I believe that the upcoming COP28 will, will present a different and a new perspective. And I invite uh, all of the uh, participants and audience to follow this uh, uh, important event. I would like just to uh, call the attention very simply and very briefly, if you allow me, Gerard, that the idea of multilateralism Sometimes it is exploited. Sometimes it is exploited to. Sometimes it is exploited to create uh, stereotypes and and achieve influence uh, in away from the ethics and away from the values of human values. The the risks that are. Uh, associated with the uh, with the, with enforcing one lifestyle or one pattern on certain communities or certain nations, this is also is considered a common threat, which uh, intellectuals and cultural figures should contribute to countering it. The attempts to enforce a cultural pattern under the name of multilateralism is something very dangerous and uh, it threatens the efforts that uh, are being done to promote positive multilateralism. I believe that the open discussions and the candor we have, uh, like in our session today, will create new opportunities to explore multilateralism from LT multi dimensions. And I would like to comment here the model of Kazakhstan that uh, represents the best image of multilateralism. I, I remember last year the uh, the uh, the Congress of uh, World and Traditional Religions leaders. We we have witnessed here in in in, in this country that has gathered more than 108 religious uh, leaders talking about these values. Thank you. 
Um, thank you very much. And last question, but at least I would like to ask uh, Anil. Um, you have um, had a very successful uh, ministerial um, summit in Cape Town because basically the message was um, the law of the world should not be done by the West alone. That was the message. It was understood by everybody. Uh, but you are a multilateral uh, organization, but how do you overcome the huge contradictions you have within yourself? One contradiction is India, which is the biggest population of the world, would like to be a member of the Security Council. But everybody knows that it will never happen because China is a member of the Security Council and has got veto power. So just it will never happen. Since you have a, an organization uh, with uh, China and India sitting together, explain please to us how it works and how it can be helpful. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Interesting observation. Ambassador to the European Union. You had UK leave the European Union, despite you being a union. Why did they leave? For their own reasons. G7, you had G8, then you made it G7. Even within the G7, there's points of differences. So yes, BRICS is not a homogeneous whole. We are five independent sovereign states, different systems of governance, different nationalities, and so forth and so forth. But what keeps BRICS together are the common points of intersection that far outweighs our differences. So the collaboration is based on th those points of intersection where we have agreement. And that's what keeps BRICS as a cohesive whole. And it's not unique to BRICS. Any regional organization, you have the same challenges. No regional organization, including the African Union, is a homogeneous whole. So I'm saying that within BRICS, we have common values to which we subscribe in terms of what we'd like to see change. Yes, there are differences. You have uh, border tensions between India and China, which they must sort out bilaterally and not bring it to make it a BRICS problem. We encourage resolution of, of uh, disputes and conflict through peaceful means. But within BRICS, we try and work on those areas of convergence, and one of which is ensuring that we have a multilateral system that is functional and that is inclusive. Who has weakened the multilateral system? Who weakened it? That's the question we have to go to. And why is it so weak today? There cannot be a, a world without a multilateral order. We have no alternative. We have to work to strengthening the multilateral global order and do it as a collective and address the fault lines. There are major fault lines on the political, economic, and financial front. Imagine this world without a UN system, without a UN charter, without its purposes and principles, without the financial institutions, with all its uh, shortcomings, the Bretton Woods institution, without the World Trade Organization, what would we have? We wouldn't have a rules-based global order to function coherently, despite the challenges we have. We still function as a global community. And we are saying that we need to look at the functioning of this body that is almost 80 years old. In 2025, we'll celebrate the 80th anniversary. The League of Nations, founded in 1926, lasted not even 20 years. You had the outbreak of, of the Second World War, and then we reconfigured into the United Nations within 15 years of the founding of the League of Nations. Now you have 80 years almost gone past. The provisions of the Charter, Chapter 18 of the UN Charter, Articles 108 and 109, makes provision for a general re review. When two-thirds of the General Assembly call for a general review, there's been three general reviews since 1945. Last week, my minister, Minister Pando, 
in her input to the ministerial said, maybe it's time that we call for a general review conference to look at how we can collectively address the fault lines as it exists. We want to see a multipolar world. We have lived through the devastation of the Cold War, a bipolar world. We have seen a unipolar power and how it acts. We don't want a, a unipolar nor a bipolar. We want a multipolar world underpinned by multilateralism, underpinned by the charter, the purpose and principles of the UN, underpinned by international law. And we want a multicultural, multi-civilizational world. And I think that's the direction we have to work as a collective towards. Thank you, Chair. There could not be a better conclusion than yours, Anil, for this uh, session. Uh, thank you for Kazakhstan, who believes in multilateralism. We showed it. Uh, we showed it when uh, it uh, actually uh, launched again with the European Union the dialogue uh, between on uh, denuclearization of Iran, would, which led to um, to the agreement of Vienna of 14th of July 2015, which uh, uh, sadly enough was broken by the Trump administration. Uh, but um, Kazakhstan uh, always um, believed in multilateralism. I think that this forum takes part of it. And thank you to the speakers to attend it, to uh, the audience. And uh, the session is over. Have a good day.